Romance and Saga 2 is complicated but rewarding, frustrating yet enjoyable, and above all, a unique experience that any fan of JRPG should not miss. And by unique, I mean it does a lot of things differently from most RPGs that might initially turn new players off. I've put together six tips for anyone who's interested in what this game has to offer, especially for a first playthrough. I won't spoil the story, but I will discuss many of the mechanics to give you an idea of what to expect. As a side note, this video pertains to the remaster for PC, consoles, and mobile since that's the only official way to play in English. The remaster includes updated visuals and music, some extra content, and a few new quality of life features, although nearly all of the concepts discussed here also apply to the original Super Famicom release. No stats, characters, or core mechanics were changed for the remaster. All of the Saga games use a somewhat unique generation system to track progression in the game. Most of the game's core mechanics tie into this system in some way, so it's helpful to understand how it works. Romance in Saga 2 gives you freedom to find and complete most of the story events or scenarios in any order you want. However, after completing a certain number of events, many of which end with a boss battle, the game will shift ahead one generation. When this happens, your entire party will no longer exist, including your Emperor, who you can think of as the protagonist of the game. You'll then be asked to choose a new Emperor from a random selection of classes. Sometimes, this lets you use a class you haven't otherwise unlocked yet, and you also gain access to any battle formations unique to the class you pick. Certain formations are very useful, so you may want to read more about this online. After choosing a new Emperor, you'll be back to a party of one, and you'll then be able to recruit four new party members from any classes you've unlocked. However, you don't really lose any progress when this happens. All items and weapons your previous party had equipped will be available in your weapon stash back in Avalon, the starting town. New characters you recruit will have posted weapon and magic staffs based on your global levels. You can think of the global leveling system as a sort of hidden background character who gains stats along with your party members as they use different weapon and magic types in battle. The takeaway here is that you shouldn't get too attached to any of the characters in the game. Your global level progress is what's most important since there's a fixed number of generations and your final emperor's initial stats will depend entirely on your global levels. If your global levels are too low, you may have to spend a lot of time grinding to be able to take on the endgame bosses. Romance and Saga 2 uses a life point system to track your character's overall health. When a party member runs out of HP in battle, they lose one life point, or LP, and fall in battle. At this point, they lose an additional life point each time they are attacked, so it's important to revive characters as soon as you can. When a character runs out of LP, they die permanently and are removed from your party. Once the battle is over, you'll then have an open slot to recruit any new character you want. There are many characters in your hometown of Avalon that can be recruited from the start of the game, but you also unlock new, more powerful classes as you advance through the story. Many of the game's story events result in new classes becoming available, so talk to everyone you meet and try to win them over during story quests, since it may result in powerful new allies. Also, keep in mind that a character dying is not a big deal in this game. It's often a benefit as it gives you the opportunity to try a different class or recruit a character with boosted stats due to your global levels. In fact, letting one of your characters die is the only way to free up a spot for a new class other than waiting for a generation shift. One last note before moving on is that if your Emperor dies in battle, the game will stop and have you choose one of your existing party members to take over as Emperor. Then, the generation will continue, however, you'll be back in Avalon and will have to trek back to where you were at in the story. Each weapon type has a set of powerful skills that can be used in battle to deal more damage or cause other effects. The game never explains how to unlock these skills, though. 
They're learned somewhat randomly in battle by using normal attacks with a weapon. I won't go into the mechanics of this here since they are rather complicated, but you can find full details elsewhere online. The gist is that it depends on both the character and the weapon type that they're using, as well as the type and strength of enemy you're attacking. Once in a while, a character will suddenly learn and use a new weapon skill in place of their regular attack. This process is called sparking a skill. You'll then be able to teach that skill to any other character starting in the next generation by using the dojo in Avalon. I highly encourage you to seek more information about this system if you're curious since it can be highly beneficial and would take a whole video to explain fully. The game displays a defense stat for each party member. However, every character actually has several different defensive stats, one for each weapon type as well as heat, cold, lightning, and status. The defensive traits box on a character's attribute screen shows an icon for each of these that has a value of 10 or higher, except for slash defense, which has an icon when a character's slash defense is at least 1. Although by the end game, 10 points in any one stat is not very high at all, so this box isn't terribly useful. If you're having trouble taking hits, I recommend looking up stat sheets online and figuring out how to get items that boost the various types of defense. Each character can equip three items, each of which can increase one or more defensive stats, and none of these stats are shown in-game. Magic is one of the simpler systems in Romance and Saga 2, but unlocking spells can be a little unintuitive. First of all, you need to be on your second generation where Gerard is the Emperor, or any generation after. Also, if you're on Gerard's generation, he needs to have his golden armor. You'll reach this point fairly early on in the game. Additionally, your Emperor needs to have at least 25 MP, or magic points. You can increase your MP by using spells in battle to raise your magic levels. You also need at least 1 million crowns in your kingdom's treasury. This isn't as much as it sounds, since chests often contain 100,000 crowns or more. Once you've met these conditions, sit on your throne in Avalon and you'll get the option to build the Magic Research Facility. After 15 battles, it'll be ready to use. This facility is where you learn new spells. You'll be able to teach any party member any type of magic, and they'll start with a magic level based on your global level for that magic type, as well as the character's hidden personal stats. You can find these in stat sheets on the web. Finally, you unlock new spells when your global magic level for any given magic type reaches a set amount. I won't go into this in detail here, but you gain global levels by using spells in combat. Check the magic research facility frequently to see if you've unlocked anything new. For my last tip, one major change made in the remaster is the addition of the Maze of Memories. Actually a set of four mazes, this is a way to make the game a little easier by giving you a good place to grind and get useful items. In fact, many of the best pieces of equipment in the game can be found in chests within each of the four mazes, including top tier armor as well as rings that provide 64% resistance to various types of magic damage. I highly recommend going through these mazes several times before taking on the late game bosses. As always, lists of which items can be found in which mazes are available online. That's all the tips I've got for you. I hope this helps with your first playthrough of Romance and Saga 2. Thanks for watching, and if you have any questions, comments, or corrections, please leave them in the comments below.